welcome Bo. Welcome, Bo. I'm so excited to have you in the, this virtual sum, summit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Bo is an old friend of mine. We have been knowing each other for many years, and, and Bo has given me so much advice. And he has an amazing background. I mean, I, I like to call you the, the grand old man of digital banking in the world. <laughs> And you are a chairman in, in tens of, a board member in tens of companies and a chairman has been. And so you have experience from companies of many, many sizes. So, Bu, uh, could you a little bit open up your backstory for, 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 for the viewers? <laughs> well, my backstory started in, in the 70s when I joined banking. And one of the things that I thought important for the customer value was the payment automation early on and then we later on came to the conclusion that it doesn't make sense to force uh, people to leave their homes and offices to come to banks bank offices to, to make payments and, and likes so instead we uh, introduced uh, home banking and and uh, enterprise banking in the early 80s and we became the biggest uh, e-bank in the world and have stayed very much there thanks to the big Nordea bank nowadays uh, counted by a number of payment transactions actually yeah. that was the starting point uh, and then we were able later on to to introduce also e-identification services which is uh, reusing the bank login codes when you log into tax or health or whatever and this year it's going to be used 150 million times in a small country like Finland. So that was a very important next okay. there. Hey, when did Finland, by the way, leave the, the paper checks? Do you that remember was in, that? That was in 1983. It was a very dramatic event. I, I well remember it. Oh, well. <laughs> we decided to put a 50 penny, that would be about 5 euro cents, a price on a paper check when they were picked up and bran branches or mailed and when people saw the actual cost that they had paid before in a hidden way okay they using checks right away yeah and then you have been the chairman in many companies Bo. can you tell me a little bit about how it is to be a board member in small smaller companies <laughs> well it's quite different i would say from from big companies. In big companies you have a, a clear problem, a challenge with the strategy work, the way it has been done so far in most of the cases where I also have been involved myself. It's the top management that is doing the work and uh, the staff is not involved until it's kind of too late. Yeah. And that, that when the strategy is rolled out it is not actually owned by them. In the worst case it's owned only by consultants. Uh, and when they leave, nobody continues from there. Um, so the implementation... It's quite fantastic. I mean, it's hard to believe. <laughs> well, that is unfortunately still the case, uh, even if one should have learned from that. In small enterprises, obviously, the whole thing is to have a, a team and to live together. Uh, yeah. and, and the strategy can be built in, in quite a different way. So, so um, that is... A pretty different story from from the big ones. I know that you have been a, a chairman also of this software company until the beginning of this year, and 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 they did a remarkable wor work with uh, with putting their strategy on on one page. Can you uh, can you tell me about the situation when when th that idea came up and what was the reason for it? How many were working there by the way? Then <laughs> about thirty people uh, altogether, a little bit over. The um, reason for doing it was that uh, we were actually uh, selling out a part of the activities, the chat services and the like, and we were putting a less effort on the voting aid uh, software. And then we needed to make it clear, a clearer mission to start with why was very much uh, the topic. And yeah. to build on that, to, to get the, uh, let's say, passion shared with the staff that was the reason why we why we did one page so uh, and and uh, you followed the work from the from the board so how 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 did they do it what was the process 
It was really a question of involving the staff very much there. It was also done in connection with a great place to work a competition where we actually managed to come out as the winner. Uh, so the staff was, was really oh. owning the whole thing, which I think is in any company should be the starting point. If you have the mission owned by, by, the, by everyone in the staff, then the vision is getting clearer and also the, the, how, the, how it shall be done between the mission and the vision is, is getting much more concrete and owned by everyone. Yeah, Bo, we have been also talking with you about the, this word purpose and, and, and the, the, the relation of the word purpose to, to mission and vision. So uh, can you a little bit give your views on that? <laughs> yeah, I very much equalize mission and purpose with each other. So the question is really that you should ask yourself, uh, why is this company uh, existing in the first place. What is its purpose? What What is its mission? And then many people say that's to earn money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely not the way to, to express it because <laughs> then you won't earn the money. Uh, people buy, do not buy what you sell, but uh, why you do it, that is kind of biology. So it's uh, pretty clear. Simon Sinek is, is very clear on that in his TED Talks. Yeah. I think that has become one of the most seen TED Talks in the world. So it is actually implementing companies very much more than, than people perhaps remember. Yeah, I have also the experience about vision that, that uh, I, I think I visited some 300 companies. And, and, you know, I know the vision before I go into the door. And because they all, all tend to have the vision to be the number one or leader or, or synonym to that. So now we're thinking is that why, why do you... Uh, why do we need to state that kind of vision? Couldn't we have a purpose that evolves in the future? What do you think about that, Bo? <laughs> well, I absolutely agree. It's, it's almost a joke to see those vision statements uh, repeated all over again, and it's not actually guiding very much at all. In my opinion, the vision should be pretty near today based on, on the purpose and, and what, you, what we want to achieve in a kind of a uh, nearer future, then, then it can be related to and it sounds much more realistic and, and the steps in between when implementing the strategy is becoming much yeah. more, making much more sense. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the, the founder CEO a little bit. Uh, so uh, you've seen a company with 30, 30 people. So um, I heard from many founder CEOs that, that they, when they come up to 25 people or something like that, they start to almost be burned out because they can't anymore be in every meeting, you know, and, 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 uh, because, and then the people tend to go in a little bit different directions and then the need to align the company better. In the, but in your case, we had this, you, you sold a part of the company out and that was the great need to crystallize what is left did I understand correctly but that was absolutely what we did and I think uh, we should perhaps reevaluate uh, the importance of having a single purpose company so when you have divisions and many different products they tend to start civil wars right away and much of the energy goes on that who is getting the, the money needed for investments and so forth so the single purpose thing that we did was was a kind of must do and, and that is perhaps something that needs to be readdressed a little bit. Uh, because small companies, they have challenges, as we know, compared to, to big ones, uh, let's say different challenges. And, and they should try to build on, on having a very focused uh, purpose. Yeah. And, and this vest uh, whenever it is possible. But then again, uh, you need to, to find ways to network with other actors in the markets to, to get your message through. Yeah. The real challenge is that there is no time any, anymore. The attention span has shrunk to eight seconds. And if you, if you could try to get in there alone all the time, you may have problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And then, uh, then what was I was going to say to you that uh, uh, what, what kind of comments did the, did the personnel give from when they were involved in the strategy work? Did you hear directly from them and how did it affect the mood of the company? Well, I think it was the basis for actually winning the Great Place to Work competition that it was like one person, the whole company, 
the, the level of enthusiasm was absolutely great. Yeah. And that is that you can't otherwise you can't do that. So it was it was a fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now when uh, when the situation came to that point that they had now the the new strategy, and now now starts the so to say the implementation. What is your uh, experience of that bull also in other companies? What happens then? Well, too often uh, it is kind of seen as a as a one once off exercise and now we have a new strategy in place and and then it is kind of forgotten and and maybe the implementation is is not directed in the right place it is uh, it is uh, hidden be, be, behind the workload of today and so forth and so forth so the implementation is is obviously the weak spot especially in large companies i would say but also in, in smaller ones because there are so many other things to attend to and if it is too mystical and above all if it's not owned by the entire staff yeah. then it may become uh, a challenge well uh, and yeah that, now i remember what i should ask you is that i mean this uh, this founder ceo typically he's a very creative person you mm -hmm. know and we have so many ideas uh, that we should do and the eight second span is that everything must happen today and tomorrow we have a de deadline or coming up so it's really hard you know um, among all these ideas bigger and smaller ideas to focus on, on the on the big thing which is the strategy so so my question is that uh, how do you think about this that how should we prioritize and how should we work both with with what what we must do today f for a client and, and then a little bit longer term uh, things that we need for our success. How should we solve this thing, Bo? <laughs> yeah, that is a very difficult question, obviously, to find the right balance. Uh, you need to know where you are heading in, a, uh, because you have a purpose, you have to get somewhere to the vision, which has to yeah. be, be pretty near in the future. And if that is clear, then you have, and owned by everyone, then you have a pretty good possibility to, to try to find a balance. Yeah. But of course, it's also a question about what kind of personalities you have in a company. And it's not a particularly good idea if you have only one strong-headed man in, in charge when it grows bigger, and the rest have become used to actually just listen to what he's saying, because then you'll have a crisis sooner or later. So to build a kind of a balanced team uh, which is very close to the staff. Uh, that is that is really what is the key thing to do there when you are heading for growth. Yeah, I, I remember one one very a big chief that I really honored said that that it's a question of a delicate balance. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that's a good. It's expression. a delicate ba balance between yeah. long term and short term. And, and, and then, and, and then uh, about the teams, you know, in the beginning there usually is only one, one guy who is the founder, you know, and he has all the ideas and the other one is very enthusiastic, you know, and, and spreads the enthusiasm, but then comes the point when he can't be in every room and then you have to get the people to. Well, it is of course very clear that there is nothing as contagious as enthusiasm except one thing. That of enthusiasm <laughs> That's even more contagious and and uh, but there's always a danger with this enthusiasm if you have a very inspira inspirational story to go it bec may become too enticing that you actually uh, run over the cliff you don't remember to question everything has to be questioned one way or the other and, and this is something that is actually happening in the startup world pretty regularly as, as I've seen that you actually start believing in your own bullshit and that is not a good idea <laughs> so uh, what is your your best practice that you have seen about how to how to manage this and and when you have written a strategy and you have this big idea now and but then to be sensible to the to the surrounding and what the customers say and agilely uh, the, uh, the direct yourself to a new 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 direction how how to do that to update the strategy so to say well, I think a strategy should be updated 
all the time. And, and that is a process that we haven't seen actually being implemented as a kind of a, of a philosophy. I haven't come across that uh, often enough anyway. And yeah. something that should perhaps be rebuilt that now we are thinking about the future. Maybe, maybe it's a good idea to try to do it through scenarios that, that you have from the beginning set up scenarios and chosen one. And then you keep questioning that, is this scenario actually going our way? And if it's not, then you then you restart the discussion again with the staff so that uh, scenario changes do not come as uh, as as a kind of a okay. shock. But everything is not smooth and fine uh, fine balls. So, but uh, if we ask still uh, your experience about what has gone well in, in in working with the strategy, so what what would you what is your answer on the positive sides? On the positive side, if you get the mission and the purpose in place, that that is setting the organization to fire. That is leading to okay. good sales and, and that is leading to good profits in, in that order, of course. And the customers realize that you are there for them and not for your own profit and, and all that, which is very self-evident. So so and, and then if you have done that with the staff, then then the implementation is way easier because everyone is kind of responsible for it they yeah. have had the right to speak up and they have actually formulated it together so, so yeah. that's, that's a kind of a no-brainer okay but but then let's talk about about uh, the traps in the process so so i mean you've probably seen many of those also so so what do you come to think of what are the main main traps <laughs> Well, the key trap that comes from the large enterprise size is, is the KPI. And, and the KPI gets into, into a kind of a main role. So all the calculations, there's so much calculation and so little inspiration in that process. And, and you key performance that, indicators, yeah. <laughs> you can endlessly go on trying to calculate that what kind of performance, key performance indicator uh, is, is right and, and how is it treating people correctly? Do I get the right uh, customers for my performance uh, and so forth and so forth? So, so over planning is probably the most difficult thing that we tend to continue because the world is absolutely full of uncertainties, but still we treat it like we would be able to plan the future and use a lot of time there. And that's not particularly motivating for the staff either. Bravo, boo, bravo, boo. There you said it. There you said it. So, you, so it's a kind of insecurity thing. This planning that if we if we really analyze, I believe in this. That if we we kind of people think that if we analyze and analyze and analyze, then we can control the future. And my belief is that you can't control the future. You, the agility is the only answer. Absolutely, nobody was planning to see an internet coming like it did, and nobody actually. <laughs> Could understand yeah. that Google would be such an important thing, and so forth. That is implementing, is influencing everything that we do on a daily basis. So you just need to have a, a general a direction, and then a lot of agility. And, and all this planning and planning and over planning is actually killing the, the agility. Yeah, and then if we think of big companies, the strategic plan plans are they are thick, you know, piles of uh, uh, slides, you know, slide decks with with uh, I've seen you know 150 slides in in a, in a, uh, a billion company and and, uh, and and I mean nobody reads it and now this idea to squeeze it on one page, then the updating process is much more much more um, uh, agile. Also, it's easier to update and then. Yeah, I if you yeah. try to squeeze something into one into in, in a big company into one page, then every every word will will be will weigh a ton and it's it's so much behind the word, so it's very difficult to actually relate to it in a kind of a, a good way. There's one thing that I would perhaps say today that uh, that is becoming so much more important, and that is the the story. Uh, what is your story? What is your narrative? Yeah. And if you can't, if you can't have a proper narrative, you won't be success, successful. If you can't tell your customers into this eight second or your staff that what is it that we actually are doing in our, what is our purpose uh, in, in practical terms, then, then you will have problems because eight seconds is eight seconds. And, and that's a totally new situation that we actually have come, yeah. come in now here. Yeah, so uh, I call that the purpose story. Exactly. And I think it's 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 a really strong one. And if you have eight seconds to tell that story, so 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 
Uh, and the point with the story, why it's so, so strong, is that if you remember the point, you can always generate the story. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the, why it's so uh, a, a really strong communication tool, that people just have to remember the point and then they can make the, their own version of the story in eight seconds. Exactly, yeah. and uh, we have to say that, uh, that if, uh, if something is easy to understand, <clears throat> if, the, if the story is easy to understand, then it will be repeated. And yeah. if it's re repeated, uh, then it will change the world. But if you have a very complicated story, and the narrative is not clear, and then you have an audience that have eight seconds time, if it would be a goldfish, it would be nine seconds. <laughs> then, you have a, then you have a real problem. You have a, yeah. uh, something. But there's one other thing that one should also say here is that nobody can actually uh, change the world uh, alone. It needs to be a network, a partners, and the co-innovation thing should actually happen with people from the customers and suppliers and the like. And I have so many times experienced it, this, that when you have a small team around the table, a diverse team, at one point of that meeting, somebody will say something that is absolutely new. And it's a kind of a shock that well, I haven't thought about this. And then I usually look at my watch, <laughs> one hour and 20 minutes, almost every time. And, and this no is kidding. The no kidding. Absolutely, I, I laugh aloud when I when I watch watch the time, and it has happened so many times that there's some something magical. The team couldn't should be too big. It should be something like five five six people. Yeah. So everyone can take part in it and throw throw in these things, and it's it's created. A, so this is why we should be at work, not to not to write emails. Yeah. Yeah. So at least the one and a half hour meeting, because otherwise you don't find that. And then somebody says one sentence, which is the killer thing. Exactly. And often enough, those people who do this, sometimes it's a so-called stupid question. They come from the edge of the network. Edge they come from the, edge, from the edge. They come from, they are not directly involved in the key problem. They are not staring at this key issue day in and day out. Uh, yeah have a different perspective and and now when the uh, when the world is changing so much thanks to the data driven economy we need totally new ideas and there's actually now for for once really space for looking at it from so many new angles in the data driven economy which is the biggest thing today you are a founding member in this my that my data global network with a short story about what is that now well, it is, firstly, it's based on a regulation, would you believe? <laughs> the GDPR in, in Europe, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, which is saying that everybody's uh, data should be protected and sh you should know where it is. And that is one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is that you have the legal right to get the data in your, for, for your use, which is so far hasn't actually been been eliminated hardly at all. So the mydata.org organization, which now is working in about 20 countries headquartered in Finland, is actually looking at both those as aspects, but especially at making the data useful. In, in service design, it means that all service design from here onwards, all, should start from the customer's life event or from the customer's customer's life event. What data does he need for that life event to actually get it solved in an ideal way? And naturally, when you when you are using artificial intelligence, you will you will blend the my data, which is owned by you. Yeah. You can empower somebody to go and get for you into that life event. You blend it with big data, and you use artificial intelligence to come up with the best solution for that particular life event. Yeah. We and that is a, this is a revolution. Yeah, this is we have been talking with more about that, and I, I think it's so wonderful when when you you are now with uh, with those minds behind you that you start to do this revolutionary data work, and there will be a lot of uh, business ideas for companies, of course, to now utilize that and, and make people's lives easier. Yeah. So well, I hope that you will get a lot of people to to listen to your stories when you are building this up now, because I think this is really for everyone. Yeah. You don't have to have a big artificial intelligence robot for, for thinking about people's life events and what data they need. 
It can be very simple. You can actually just add one link to some data in your in your service, and they will yeah. they will see that you're actually caring for for their. And there are two kinds of people, those who don't have time for surfing around and collecting the data anymore because we have invented so much time saving, no. time has run out altogether. And then the other, those who don't have the capability. And they can actually, they who do not actually use internet at all, they can give you a, a paper-based power attorney as a service provider, go and get my data on the net for me and bring it back to me over the phone or, yeah. or in the letter or whatever. So this is really democratic. And one thing that I should stress here is that this is also equalizing the, the playing field between large companies and small companies. Finally, the small companies get access to big data in, in a totally different way without using the new sense of this world. Wow. Wow. Well, I love that one. Hey, uh, Bu, uh, what would be your advice now for a for a, a, a small enterprise, medium-sized enterprise, of uh, in strategy, that what would what would be your top three advice or top two advice for for how to work with with strategy? Number one, the purpose, and call and uh, call in all the staff and say, okay, what is our purpose? And how is this purpose playing into our customers or our customers' customers' life event? How can we actually in that life event make his life easier, better, more profitable and all that? And think okay. about it, many, many rounds and, and get, get that done. Many, so many rounds, yeah. That, yeah that's, that's number one and, and it can be very small things. When you learn to catch one piece of data that you should actually bring to your customer, customers' customers' life event, uh, then, um, then you are already on the right road. So that's yeah. that's number one. That's number one. So do you have a do you have another something else still? It's number two, or or is this? Shall we leave it as the big one, <laughs> number one? This is the big one, but of course uh, it means that you have to all the time try to meet new kind of people every day. So don't yeah. stay inside the company. That try to get them. There. Yeah, that was your. That was the network advice. Yeah, that's the next, uh, the one hour, twenty minutes. Uh, thing yeah, when you have also also outsiders in that discussion. Yeah. And hey, Bo, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I, it's very valuable, and and I, I admire you in in that sense that you have this great career behind you. How many countries have you been having these presentations? You mentioned once to me. What what did over forty? What was it? Uh, it was close to 70, actually. 70? Uh, yeah, it, was, it started with e-banking and then it became EID and e-invoicing. And now it's, it's big data and my data and so forth. So it's not only the banking story, but... Uh, 70 had, countries who has presented his ideas in for different audiences. Wow. Thank you so much, Bo, for, for, for joining this and, and sharing your thoughts and your advice. And I think many of us now will really... Uh, listen to this closely and, and twice or three times to, uh, to really okay. internalize what you are saying. Thank you, Boo, and, and happy, happy work with your big task. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.